Also, again, we can see here that it says, in the age of cholera, the poor helpless animals, especially the cows, which are meant to receive all sorts of protection from the administrative heads, are killed without restriction. So again, we see the importance of cow protection and how that relates to the human society, that the protection of everything that is good and everything that is right is like a habit that we get into. So it is very difficult to take advantage and to exploit and to kill the beings that are lesser than us, then all of a sudden jump up onto the platform of that we're going to respect each other, that we're going to protect each other, that we're going to take care of each other. We have to practice with the lower entities or the so-called lesser beings, and then it will be more practical for us to enact this kind of policy within the human society. Okay. So let's move on to text six. You rogue. So this is this is uh, the this is Kali. He's beating on the cow, and Maharaj Pariket is the the saintly king is speaking to him. You rogue. Do you dare beat an innocent cow because Lord Krishna and Arjuna, the carrier of the Gandiva bow, are out of sight? Since you are beating the innocent in a secluded place, you are considered a culprit and therefore deserve to be killed. Purport. In a civilization where God is conspicuously banished and there is no devotee warrior like Arjuna, the associates of the age of Kali take advantage of this lawless kingdom and arrange to kill innocent animals like the cow in secluded slaughterhouses. Such murderers of animals stand to be condemned to death by the order of a pious king like Maharaj Pariket. For a pious king, the culprit who kills an animal in a secluded place is punishable by death penalty exactly like a murderer who kills an innocent child in a secluded place. Uh-oh. Okay. So what could be said here that, according to the Vedic principles, the murder of a cow or any other kind of innocent animal is similar to killing a child? So we just start taking this a little bit more seriously than what we have, have been in the past, especially if we want to enact some real solutions for this society and if we really want to understand why everything is so in chaotic and so in disorder. We have to start taking the slaughter of the animals a little bit more seriously and the effects that can be having on the people who not only perpetrate it but also who uh, eat the remnants of the satanic sacrifice, what that could be doing to their minds in terms of violence, in terms of killing, in terms of ignorance, etc. Okay, let's move on to text 7. Then he, Maharaj Pariket, asked the bull, Oh, who are you? Are you a bull? Are you a bull as white as a lotus? Or are you a demigod? You have lost three of your legs and are moving only on only one. Are you some demigod causing us grief in the form of a bull? Purport. At least up to the time of Maharaj Pariket, no one could imagine the wretched conditions of the cow and bull. Maharaj Pariket, therefore, was astonished to see such a horrible scene. He inquired whether the bull was not a demigod, assuming such a wretched condition to indicate the future of the cow and the bull. Text 8. Now for the first time in the kingdom, well protected by the arms of the kings of the Kuru dynasty, I see you grieving with tears in your eyes. Up till now, no one on earth has ever shed tears because of royal negligence. Purport. The protection of the lives of both the human beings and the animals is the first and foremost duty of a government. A government must not discriminate in such principles. It is simply horrible for a pure-hearted soul to see organized animal killing by the state in this age of Kali. Maharaj Pariket was lamenting for the tears in the eyes of the bull, and he was astonished to see such an unprecedented, unprecedented thing in his good kingdom. Men and animals were equally protected as far as life was concerned. That is the way in God's kingdom. So rather than sitting around waiting for the second coming or the third coming or whatever coming that we're waiting for, we can immediately start to feel the effects of God's kingdom. If we would just stop killing the innocent animals and stop treating each other in all these horrible ways. So I recommend to people that we should have kingdom on the kingdom of God on earth now. Well, why are we waiting, and what exactly is it that we're waiting for? I really don't know anymore. So if we can enact these principles of kindness and compassion to every living entity, we can start to see the beauty 
and the respect of God's kingdom on earth right here, right now. And all this waiting around is nonsense. And neither Jesus wants us to wait, nor Buddha, nor Muhammad, nor Krishna. None of them recommend that we wait around for some future date to become righteous, and that all of them plead with us to become righteous now. So let's take it from the Srimad Bhagavatam that it is possible to start to see the effects of God's kingdom on earth and turn back the tide of Kali Yuga, and turn back the tide of violence, and hatred, war, secular infighting between falsified religions. All these things can be turned back immediately if we start to adopt these principles. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention that if anybody would like to call in, I'll give the call in number 661 467 2419. That's 661 467 2419. So you can call in and we can have a little discussion about some of the things that I've been speaking about. In the meantime, I'll go on with to the next verse. O son of Sarabi, you need lament no longer. There is no need to fear this low-class sudra. And, O mother cow, as long as I am living as the ruler and subduer of all envious men, there is no cause for you to cry. Everything will be good for you. Purport. Protection of bulls and cows and all other animals can be possible only when there is a state ruled by an executive head like Maharaj Parikit. Maharaj Parikit addresses the cow as mother, for he is a cultured, twice-born Chachiya king. Sarabi is the name of the cows which exist in the spiritual planets and are especially reared by Lord Sri Krishna himself. As men are made after the form and features of the Supreme Lord, so also the cows are made after the form and features of the Sarabi cows in the spiritual kingdom. In the material world, the human society gives all protection to human beings, but there is no law to protect the descendants of Sarabi, who can give all protection to men by supplying the miracle food, milk. But Maharaj Parikit and the Pandavas were fully conscious of the importance of the cow and bull, and they were prepared to punish the cow killer with all chastisement, including death. There has sometimes been agitation for the protection of the cow, but for want of pious executive heads and suitable laws, the cow and the bull are not given protection. The human society should recognize the importance of the cow and the bull and thus give all protection to these important animals, following in the footsteps of Maharaj Parikit. For protecting the cows and Brahminical culture, the Lord, who is very kind to the cow and the Brahmanas, Go Brahmana Hitaya, will be pleased with us and bestow upon us real peace. So again, this, this verse has got a lot of important information that we need to take a look at here for a few minutes. One important piece of information is that beyond the material planets and the material sky, there is a spiritual kingdom full of spiritual planets. Now, I think that this has become an item of spiritual fear-mongering that we're going to become merged into a white light or something such like this. Is that the condition of the material world, sometimes people become so disgusted and so fearful that when they hear about the conception of a personal God or a personal supreme personality of Godhead or a spiritual kingdom full of spiritual planets, full of light and wonderment, that they can't imagine such a thing because they try to compare it to the condition that we have here in the material planets. But let's just take a look at this logically, that if there is a supreme personality of Godhead, if there is a supreme creator of all that be, he would have to contain all the aspects which in, within the living entity plus more. So if I have a personal feature, how can the supreme personality of Godhead or the supreme creator not have a personal feature? That would mean that he would be lacking in something that even an ordinary living entity such as myself, not that any of us are ordinary, I don't mean to give that impression. Everyone is extremely powerful, extremely brilliant, extremely genius, but I know that I'm not God or the Supreme Creator because let's say, for example, if I have a toothache, you know, I have to seek shelter of a dentist, you know, to get treatment. You know, the Supreme Personality of Godhead would have to be at least a little bit more powerful than that. So to say that he lacks some feature that even I have, which is namely personality, 
is not logical. There must be personality there. But it is not like in this world where different personalities are trying to exploit each other, different personalities are trying to harm each other, person, different personalities have so many character flaws and defects and are willing to hurt other living entities. It's not a personality like that. It's a personality full of spiritual knowledge, spiritual bliss, spiritual eternity, which is also our nature. This is why the concept of self-realization is important. Why should we examine ourself to get spiritual realization? This is a very important topic, a very important uh, idea. Let's take a look at that for a second. Why should I examine myself in order to gain spiritual knowledge? Now, we see sometimes, like, through these Oprah Winfrey shows and these different things, that a lot of times when people start to examine themselves, it just becomes like a self-indulgent thing, and actually they become more hedonistic more uh, greedy. So that is not the kind of, of self-introspection that we should be looking for that to become self-absorbed, but rather what are the qualities that I have within myself that can be related and understood to be part and parcel of the Creator? Just like if there's a drop of water in the ocean, we take that drop of water, we can examine it, that what we, we can see that the ocean has liquidity. The ocean has saltiness. The ocean has different living entities living within it. Just by examining the drop of water, there's a lot of things that we can understand about the entire ocean. So in the same way, this is why self-realization is important. Because by examining ourself, our true self, not in some greedy, hedonistic, self-absorbed way, but we can start to understand that some of the qualities that are there within the creator of all that be. For example, we, don't, we seek pleasure and we don't like to experience death. So in that sense, we can understand what the nature of the Creator would be, would be eternity. Otherwise, if death were natural to us, we would embrace it. We wouldn't be so fearful of it or trying to avoid it. So we can understand that in our perfected state, in a relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, that that relationship would have to be eternal with no death. So we can, we can examine ourselves in many other ways to try to find out the, different, the nature of our relationship with eternity. And as we progress through this, we can look at some more things like that. But for now, let's move on to the next verse. This is text 10 and 11. O chaste one, the king's good name, duration of life, and good rebirth vanish when all kinds of living beings are terrified by miscreants in his kingdom. It is certainly the prime duty of the king to subdue first the sufferings of those who suffer. Therefore, I must kill this most wretched man because he is violent against other living beings. Purport. When there is some disturbance caused by wild animals in a village or town, the police or others take action to kill them. Similarly, it is the duty of the government to kill at once all bad social elements such as thieves, dacoits, and murderers. The same punishment is also due to animal killers because the animals of the state are also the praja. Praja means one who has taken birth in the state, and this includes both men and animals. Any living being who takes birth in a state has the primary right to live under the protection of the king. The jungle animals are also subject to the king, and they also have the right to live. So what to speak of domesticated animals like the cows and bulls? Any living being, if he terrifies other living beings, is the most wretched subject, and the king should at once kill such a disturbing element. As the wild animal is killed when it creates disturbances, similarly any man who unnecessarily kills or terrifies the jungle animals or other animals must be punished at once. By the law of the Supreme Lord, all living beings, in whatever shape they may be, are the sons of the Lord. And no one has any right to kill another animal unless it is so ordered by the codes of natural law. The tiger can kill a lower animal for his sustenance, but a man cannot kill an animal for his sustenance. That is the law of God, who has created that law that a living being subsists by eating another living being. Thus the vegetarians are also living by eating other living beings. Therefore, the law is that one should live only by eating specific living beings as ordained by the law of God. The Ishopanishad directs that one should live by the direction of the Lord 
and not at one's sweet will.